Hey guys, Jared Wesley here of Live Traders and it is that time of the week. It is lecture time and this week's topic is how to use pivots to determine targets, right? There's a lot of people out there that are unsure when they're in the middle of a trade or before they take a trade where their target should be on the chart, right? So we talked a couple few weeks back about trade management. There's a lot of different styles of trade management, all or nothing, bar by bar, add and reduce pivots, moving averages, et cetera, and so forth. But determining targets is a little bit different. And depending on the type of trade management that you use, that could also have an adverse impact on whether or not you should be taking that specific trade. For example, if the target is very close, you might only be able to scalp the trade. If the target is far away and there's a lot of room, you might be able to take that trade and manage it out on pivot. So understanding the pivots, where they are on the chart and how it relates to your trading as well as trade management is very important. So on top of that, we also go and talk a little bit about different patterns and where they are in the chart. For example, there's an example in here um, of a three bar play that mm, isn't the best three bar play in the world, but I think it's the type of three bar play that many of you out there would be tricked into taking, okay? And you don't want to take it. And I explain why you don't want to take that specific three bar play. All right, so in my opinion, it's a pretty good lecture. There are no tech slides, it's all charts. All charts, all the time on it. And yes, when will the insanity is brought back this week because the insanity couldn't stop forever, right? Um, so anyway, all in all, it's about 40 minutes. It's a pretty good lecture on a myriad of topics, but specifically pivots as they relate to targets. If you like this video, guys, please click that like button. As always, subscribe to the channel. I'm Jared Wesley of Live Traders. Let's get to it. This week's topic is determining targets using pivots. Uh, I got a couple emails over this uh, in the last week or so about how do you determine targets and I thought this would be an appropriate topic because one of the things we talked about in the last couple of few weeks was trade management, right? We talked about psychology uh, a week or so ago and then we also talked about trade management. Uh, and a lot of people, you know, they get caught up in the all or nothing, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with all or nothing. But for the people that maybe don't want to do all or nothing or they are doing all or nothing um, but aren't sure if there's enough room for the trade to work, we're going to talk a little bit about determining targets using pivots. It's really actually a fairly simple lecture to be honest with you. It's mostly charts. In fact, it's not mostly. There's not a single text slide in this particular presentation. So completely different from last week or so when it was mostly text slides. All right, but before we do that, we have to get to when will the insanity stop, okay? Um, last week was a bit of an anomaly and I didn't have one, okay? Um, so this week I had to make sure I had one uh, because I don't want people to think there's no insanity out there. Um, so this one was actually sent to me probably soon enough that I could have put it in last week, um, but uh, I just didn't get a chance to. So this particular person lost 80% of their account on one trade, all right? And I put at the bottom in, in yellow there, Tesla's battery day was approaching, and, I, and I'm quoting, and I'm quoting, and I went all in, 100% of my account the night before. I woke up the next morning and my account was down 80%. Okay, now obviously this person is clearly aware of the insanity because they said, when will the insanity stop story? All right, and they sent it to me saying, hey, I did something pretty dumb here. But what we have to do is a little backstory. This person started the year with $5,000, okay, five grand. And they got that five grand up to 50,000. So I think we can all probably say that how they got their 5,000 up to 50,000 was probably not the way you're supposed to go about it, right? Because they did this in a relatively short period of time and to, you know, 10X your account in six months with little experience is probably a lot of gambling in there. So what I'm getting at, what I'm getting at is this, it caught up to them, okay? See, a lot of traders will do silly things in the beginning and sometimes later on, right? A lot of play traders will just, you know, they'll risk too much and they get away with it for a period of time. Sometimes that period of time is a month, sometimes it's a year, sometimes it's three months, right? And then ultimately it catches up to everybody. And this is why 
some people resist money management when they're new because like, well, it's working for me. What do you, I'm not gonna listen to you, you're a fool, Jared. I took 5,000 and 50,000, what the hell do you know? No, it will catch up to you. It's not an if, it's a when. And how egregious it will be, well, depends on how aggressive you are, all right? So this particular person used a, what I would consider a relatively, well, shitty reason to go 100% into a trade. Tesla's battery day was approaching. Like, what do you really know about battery day? You're just buying into the hype of Tesla, which is what a lot of people have done this year. And it bit you and it bit you heavy. But here's what I told this person. Okay. And this is, I emailed this person back and these are my exact words. You should be the happiest person in the world. And the person was like dumbfounded by my comment. I said, the reason you should be the happiest person in the world is because if your numbers are accurate and I'm going off your numbers, you doubled your trading account in your first six months of trading. If you lost 80%, that means you lost $40,000. And if you started with five, you now have 10. You doubled your trading account being the dumbest person in the world doing some of the stupidest shit imaginable, and you still doubled your account. And if you learned from it, you still doubled your account, and now you have twice as much money as when you started, and you learned a really hard lesson, and you got paid to learn that lesson. I'm not joking, it's not even funny, it's the truth. This person had no business doubling their account right? Trading the way they trade. They had no business doubling their account, but they did. And they learned one of the hardest lessons out there. They still walked with five extra thousand dollars. Okay. And I have one more, when will the insanity stop this week? This one is the, I don't know, the most ironic one I've ever had ever. Maybe I don't want to call it the most egregious one. It's the most ironic one, but when will the insanity stop? Oh my goodness gracious. Look at this person. That is Unmall on the left. And that's who, what do they call him? Is that Paulie D? Is that his name? Oh, I mean, the similarities are striking. If we put a beard on Paulie D, and I probably should have Photoshopped that in, I mean, they look the same. The chain's a little bit smaller, okay? But Unmall got a haircut like a month ago. And it's like, I've known Unmall for like 10 years, and I've never seen him look like this. It's, it's the only thing I could think of is Paulie D. As soon as I saw him, I was like, Paulie D? Anyway, just insane to me, but I'm happy he cut his hair, makes him look a little more, uh, I don't know, professional maybe, I'm not sure. All right, stop the madness. Let's get into the good stuff, okay? All right, so like I said, no tech slides, just purely chart slides today, okay? And I took a lot of these from yesterday, all right? I think most of these charts are from yesterday's trading. Uh, there are a couple that aren't. Um, so. When I scan in the morning, I get lots of questions all the time. Why did you pick this gap or why did you pick that gap, um, et cetera, and so forth. And the other comments I'll get is in the middle of the trading day, somebody will ask me about a stock and say, hey, what do you think about X, Y, Z? And I'll say, no, it's right near support or no, it's, not, it's right near resistance. Um, and that's not necessarily the gap. Sometimes it's the gap plus the intraday move. Okay, so when you look here, this is IBM from yesterday. IBM gapped down. Yes, it gapped from a red bar, but it gapped under this pivot, okay? And it gapped under this uh, green bar and deeply into this territory here. Now you could make an argument right here that this was some form of support because it was a gap down that bullied, right? It was, it was a gap down that bullied. Um, so you could certainly make that argument, but when you look to the left, and this is a common comment I make. Did you look to the left? I should just play that Beyonce song again and again. But look what you have. Pivot, 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 pivot. Now granted, some of these bottoming tails are much lower, but this is a sloppy, hot mess of a chart. But here's the rub. That doesn't mean you can't trade this chart. You can trade this chart, but you have to understand, firmly understand where the parameters are, where the support and resistance lines are on the chart. So when IBM moved lower yesterday and bounced at 117, you had to understand that there's a good chance it probably wasn't going to go significantly lower than that right? It might go a little bit lower than that because the pivots were at like 116.30, 116.40, right? But it probably wasn't going to go lower. So if you couldn't get your target between 116 and 117 on IBM, this is a trade you shouldn't have taken. Now, I'm not suggesting that there was a really good entry here because, well, there really wasn't a good entry. It's more about understanding during the gap pre-market what the parameters are going to be. 
okay? So when you see this thing go lower and you're thinking at the bottom, and I'm commenting because somebody in the room asked this question, and you're thinking, why'd you bring up this chart? It's not even a good pattern, Jared. And you're right, it wasn't. But then somebody brought this up at 117. And I said, well, why are you looking at shorting IBM at once? Well, it's weak. I agree with you, it's weak. But when you look at the daily chart, why in the world would you want to short this thing when one, it's put in a full day's move, right? If you look um, at the average trading range of this, it's, it's a full day's move, right? The previous three or four days, this day here was monster. And then you want to short the low after a full day's move right into support. And it's not like one bottoming tail here. There's a ton of pivots over here to the left where this stock bounced. So if you're catching yourself at 117 thinking, I want to short this stock, don't. Look to the left, okay? The target's got to be somewhere between 116 and 117, probably like 116.50 to 117, okay? And then it gets even worse. It bounces and then retest 117. And what's the expectation on the retest? The expectation on the retest is it's going to bounce because it's put in a full day's move at an area of daily support, significant daily support. So the expectation here is bounce. Now I understand that I believe towards the end of the day, IBM retested because the market just went for a serious ride, but it never really broke this daily pivot. But the point I'm making here is twofold. One, know your targets before you take the trade. And two, knowing those target areas before you take the trade will help you understand where the turn could be. And in this case, IBM is telling you where the turn is, right? Double bottom retest at an area of prior five minute support in an area of daily support with a bottoming tail saying, hey, it's aggressive, but you could actually buy IBM here, right? You could actually buy IBM right there because of not just the five minute, but because of the daily as well. So not only are you understanding where your target's going to be, you're understanding where the turn should be, where the stock's likely going to pivot in a micro time frame. We're not talking about this thing going back to 127. We're talking about this thing getting back to 119 or 120. So it's, it's really helpful to know where that is. So let's take another example from yesterday. Okay. CVNA. All right. Same thing. Gap down from a red bar. And we talked about this being an interesting idea if it could get under this 203 area right? So it's gapping again from a red bar. There's a little bit of pivot here, and then you have this support. And if it breaks 203, you're looking at a free fall into this void here to the left, probably down to as low as 160. Okay. So again, what happens here? Somebody's looking at CVNA at, one, at 204 and going, ooh, this looks like a really good pattern. I love this bearish engulfing bar, right? So you have a couple consolidation bars, a big green bar comes in right here and gets completely engulfed by this red bar. Bounces up, comes right back to 204 and everyone's licking their chops. 204, 204, but here's the rub. If you get in at 204, you're probably gonna need a $4 stop loss, right? You're gonna need a stop loss at 208 because the entry is 204 and I don't see any other area you could place that stop loss. It was a very spready, whippy stock to begin with, but what are you really doing here? $200 is this support area on the daily. And you're going to get in at 204 knowing you need 4 to $8 for a target. Knowing you need 4 to $8, this makes this trade tough, doesn't it? Because you might have $4, because the point I'm making also that I haven't talked about yet is support and resistance are areas. They're not exact pennies. Just because the bottom of this bottoming tail is $200 doesn't mean that's the exact penny this stock is going to bounce. It may bounce at 201. It may bounce at 199. I don't know. Somewhere in that range. Okay. But we know that the last couple times this stock treated to this area, it ripped and it bounced over here as well. So taking this at 204, and this is where, and I'm going off on a couple little tangents here. There's a lot of little information here. This is where knowing the expectation really matters, doesn't it? Because if you got in at 204 and you're like, you know, I'm going to try to, try to scalp a couple bucks out of this thing. You know, I know it's got support at, at 200 bucks. I know it's a wide stop loss, um, but I'm going to just try to scalp one, two, three bucks. You could probably get away with that trade, right? And this goes back to knowing your expectation, right? We talked about trade management a couple of few weeks ago. For example, you're not going to hit three R targets using one minute bar by bar. You're not going to go and use 15 minute pivots without protecting right? Meaning you could be up 5R with nothing protected. Note, 
the give and take is different. The expectation is different. So you might be able to scalp this, but if your expectation is 2R all or nothing, how do you take this trade? Do you see what I'm getting at here? So now that we know the target, it absolutely affects our approach to the trade. Because on a 15 minute chart or on a five minute, this is not a terrible pattern, but if your expectation is all or nothing 2R, you need $8. Eight dollars means 196. The stock is probably not going to get to 196. There's just too much support at 200 bucks. Now, if you're the type of person that says, "Okay, well, I get into a trade, and every quarter hour the trade moves, I raise my stop a quarter hour. Every half hour, I raise it a half hour." Right? You might say, "All right, I understand there's support at 204. I get it." But because my management's tighter. I'm going to be able to trail it down. So by the time this starts to move to 202, 201, I'm probably going to be in an area of protection or very little exposure. Maybe I'm not fully protected break even. Maybe I'm only I'm down to a quarter R, half R protection, right? So in that case, you might be able to justify a trade on CVNA and say, all right, by the time it gets to 201, I'm going to be largely protected. It's worth the chance. And if it breaks 200, maybe it just, it dies and tanks. So do you see where I'm going with this? Knowing the target has a huge impact on whether or not you can take the trade. And that also has an impact on the type of management that you use, whether or not you can take the trade. And you can see here, the stock went down to 201-ish, it bounced, it retested, and it bounced. And this is an area where you'd expect this stock to bounce. And I think the market tanked here and this continued lower, but it stopped at the low and then bounced. So this stuff's really important. And to some of these, they're really easy. Like, oh, there's a pivot to the left. Some of the pivots are a little bit harder to read, okay? Now, here's another example, but now we throw in one more kink, and the kink is pre-market, okay, pre-market. So now we have PG, and PG gapped up, all right, gapped up, took out almost this entire red bar. See, the previous day's red bar? So that's a very potent gap because you're gapping up, taking out a large percentage, the level and depth of penetration. Again, we've done lectures on level and depth of penetration. So the level and depth of penetration here is significant. And because it's significant, there's a higher likelihood it will break that prior pivot high or that topping down. But that's not a guarantee. It's just a higher likelihood. So we take this and we see that there's a topping tail. We can see that also on the five minute chart because the topping tail was a, a previous day or two before, okay? So if you look to the top of the left of the chart, you can see roughly at 145, 145.50, where the red line is, there's pivots up here, okay? You can also see from the previous day here, there's pivots up there. So we see those areas from the previous two days. This was two days prior, this was the previous day, okay? Then what happens? We go to today's gap up, and what happens? It immediately rolls off the open. But what I want you to take note of is, this is the market open at 9.30. But look at the pre-market high. See this chart down here? Five minute with pre-market? This is all pre-market information, pre-market data. And look how this thing ripped. It ripped from 144 up to 145.70, somewhere in that range what, 15, 20, 30 minutes before the market opened? So by the time the market opened, guess what happened? PG was really tired. It had moved from 144 up to 145.50, and 145.50 is double top resistance on the five minute and a topping tail on the daily right up into this resistance point. So a little bit extended into resistance. Now, many of you who don't look at pre-market charts wouldn't see that. You wouldn't see that this thing just ripped for 20 or 30 minutes in the pre-market. So when the market opened, you just fully expect PG to rip. But what happened? It got smacked. Resistance ended up being significant. And this thing didn't, I mean, it got smacked, smacked. Okay. So now let's take it one step further. We actually traded PG. And you're like, well, wait a second. You just basically gave me every reason in the world not to trade this thing. You're telling me there's resistance at 145.50, right? So this was the trade from PG that I anticipated the entry on, 
okay? And I still got filled eight cents late, okay? Point being is, this was a little bit of a buy setup, wedge buy setup. On the one minute, it looks a little bit prettier, okay? But notice, it says PG over 145.80. That was in the pre-market. In the pre-market, I really didn't want to have to buy PG on a pullback. I was hopeful we could get an app, an opportunity or an entry above 145.80, maybe a three bar play, maybe a consolidation, so that I don't have to worry about the resistance to the left at 145.50 that we just looked at on the last slide. I don't have to worry about that. Okay, but that's not what happened. That's not what materialized. Instead, PG gapped up and immediately rolled over. But it pulled back near an area of support. It left a bottoming tail on the five. I don't always like to buy buy setups that have wide range red bars into them. I prefer a more controlled pullback. But I really liked all these bottoming tails and the higher low, higher low, higher low, higher low. Those higher lows suggested buyers were stepping up sooner and sooner and sooner and sooner. Okay, so I called a trade. The entry was 144.40. I got filled at 144.48. Okay, with an order at 144.37, 10 cents late, 11 cents late. Okay, the stop was the low of the day. Notes, PG target 145.35. Why? Because it's the high of the day or close to it. It's also that 1R area, but it's also close to the high of the day. Okay, so that's important to understand because if we go back, I don't think you can expect PG just to rip through 145.50. It proved several times that this is a significant area where sellers enjoy coming in. They came in over here two days ago. They came in the previous day. They came in in the pre-market. And they also came in at 9.30 as soon as the market opened. And not just at 9.30, when the stock bounced up to that area right around, I don't know, 10.30, 10, I'm trying to see what time that is, roughly 10.40, sellers came in again. Guess what? Bounced up again, sellers came in again. So knowing the target, this red line is really, really important. Why is it important? It's important because if you got into PG where I called it at 144.40 and you were expecting 2R, you probably should not have taken the trade because the expectation was there's going to be some challenges at 145.50. But let me change that. If you got into PG and your target is 2R, but your management allows you to go to break even at 1R, it might be worth the chance, right? It might be worth the risk because you know, by the time it gets to 145.25, 145.35, you can go to break even. So even if this were to happen, which is what happened, if this were to happen, it doesn't matter. You already, you're already up 1R, you're gonna move your stop to break even and who cares? Now it's no harm, no foul, right? No harm, no foul. But if you expected 2R, totally different thought process, totally different mindset to the point where you probably shouldn't have taken the trade. And one last comment on this chart. What if, what if it had gone to 146.50 and hit your 2R target? Should you still have taken the trade? Probably not if you were doing 2R all or nothing because this is a serious level of resistance up here. So unless it came up to 145.50 and consolidated out for 20 or 30 minutes, that's different. But taking the trade on the buy setup at 144.40 and expecting a 2R move, that is an erroneous thought process because of everything to the left. Okay. And again, you can see that's what we did. We basically looked for a 1R target and walked away from it. So we had the proper expectation in alignment with where the stock was likely to pivot or pull back. Okay, all right. Now, interestingly enough, did we not just talk about CVNA? Yes, this is a repeat slide. All right, remember back up in here, CVNA, it's the same stock, same day. Everything's the same, nothing's changed, okay? But now we're looking at something different. We're not looking at the five minute anymore, we're looking at the daily and the 60. So the daily chart's the same, $200 is that kind of that area, that pivot area. And under $200, there's void below all the way down to at least 170, maybe 160, something like that, right? What do we have? 
We have a three bar play, don't we? We have a wide range bar taking out multiple bottoming tails. It peekaboos below 200, which takes out the daily pivot. And that wide range bar is followed by a narrow range resting bar. So then the question becomes, is this a good three bar play? Because I think we can make the determination that it is in fact a three bar play, but is it a good one? What do you guys think? Yay, nay, I mean, you have the benefit of hindsight, but in real time, do you think CVNA on the 60 minute chart yesterday was a good three bar play? So I'll give you guys a second to kind of mull that over, think about it. Ooh, you guys are on point today. You guys are on point today, love it. Every single person got this right. That's like, that never happens. There's always one or two people, right? Every single person, and for the reasons you guys talked about, the average trading range is a concern and it's extended. So there's two ways to say that. It's extended before the three bar play happens, meaning it's already down multiple bars here, right? Red bar, red bar, red bar, red bar, topping tail, red bar. It's down a lot from yesterday's move. And then on top of it, you're already, you've already met today's average trading range, right? If you look at the daily chart, this stock was, I don't know, 212-ish at the high, something like that, okay? And now it's all the way down at 200. So it's moved $12 in forming this three bar play, it's moved $12 to do so. Well, that's a pretty stout move. And it's not that it can't go a little bit further, but you've put in the entire move. And not only has the average trading range been met, but it's also down five or six bars before it triggers. So this is where, and, and I would understand a new trader making this mistake, and this would be a somewhat acceptable mistake for a new trader because it is a wide bar, it is a narrow bar, there is void below, so they're, like, they're checking off certain boxes, they're just missing some, okay? So this is an area where a lot of stocks will reverse and turn around because it's extended into support and it's exceeded its average trading range. There's lots of reasons for this stock to bounce here. So understanding where support is is key, but also understanding how it got there. So right, you know, when we talk in gaps, we talk not just where it is, but how did it get there? And this is both of those, okay? So how it got here was after an extended move and exceeding its ATR or met its ATR. So you probably wouldn't take this. Now, to be clear, it could work, but the odds are not as good as they need to be or should be to take this trade. Therefore, you'll pass on it. And I'm telling you, that comment I just made is one of the most challenging things for new traders to accept. It was one of the most challenging things I had to accept, okay? Two things I struggle, well, I struggle with a lot of stuff when I started, all right? But management was a tough one for me. Not looking at multiple time frames was a tough one and not understanding when to stand down. There's enough reasons not to take this trade. And the worst thing that could happen to a novice trader is they take this trade and it works because it justifies taking a bad trade. And it's not a terrible idea. It's not. There's a lot of things to say, oh, you should be looking at it at least. But by the time you go through your whole checklist, it should be a no by the time you're finished. Should you have looked at it? Yeah, you should have given this a glance. Should you have spent 10 minutes staring at it? No, but you should have definitely looked at it. And then your checklist should tell you, you know what, it's just not good enough. And that's a challenge for new traders because they look for reasons to take a trade instead of looking for reasons not to take a trade. And that's the difference, okay? And just remember, anytime you're just not entirely sure, when in doubt, stay out. There will always be another opportunity. And I get it. This is more challenging if you're having a down day. If you've had a rough start to the day, I get it. It's more challenging to have that mindfulness, that objectivity, but you need to. You need to have it, okay? All right. Now, this is a chart that has, you could argue, possibly four potential setups on it, right? Four potential setups. You have a stock that's in a downtrend. It bounces, it retests, it bounces, pulls back, consolidates, bounces, pulls back, right? You could argue we have a double bottom retest. We have buy setup number one, okay, which is right here, sorry, right there. Breakout, which is over here, and then buy setup number two. So I wanted you to just take a look at this chart because I put arrows on the next chart uh, with exactly where I'm talking about. So just take a clean look at the chart before you see the arrows. 
And now you have the arrows with potential entries. Our job is to do what? Determine how good or bad these entries are. All right. So when you look at this, and this also has to do with targets, we'll get to in just a second. Okay. When you look at this, we're moving, we're pulling back. And the first thing we do, and I don't have it drawn on here, maybe I should have put it on here, is we broke above a trend line and above a moving average. Remember, multiple concepts converging. We broke above a moving average and a trend line. We pulled back. And you're actually getting a little bit of a buy setup. And you could certainly make an argument to take this. And if you did take it, you probably want to use a stop loss below the prior pivot. Why? Because technically, this is really the first higher high, or sorry, higher low, my bad. It's probably the first higher low, okay? It did trigger, and it pulled back. So depending on where you use the stop loss, you would have stopped out if you used a tight one, and you would have probably just barely stayed in it. But is this a buy setup that we should be seriously considering? What do you guys think? Yes or no? Is this something you should be like really spending a long time? Should I buy it here? Should I not buy it here? No, it's, it's really a buy setup you really shouldn't be getting terribly aggressive with. If you wanted to nibble a quarter lot, maybe, maybe give it a lot of room. But this is so early in the transition, we're not actually transitioning. We're getting indications of transition, break above the trend line, break above the moving average, put in a higher high, right? We're getting indications of a trend change. But we haven't yet changed trend. So to buy this double bottom with this steep retracement, right? Good call, Jeff, right? Is aggressive. It is. It's aggressive. And I think it's too aggressive. It's not worth it. Because if we're right on the transition, the stock has room back to $21 because the move down is smooth. So if we're right about it, we don't need to be the first one in. Let's wait for a safer entry. So anyway, pulls back, rips higher. And what happens? It stalls right in a little bit of a resistance point. Not quite, remember, their areas. So this prior pivot high with a topping tail, it stalls right here. And then it pulls back. Now we have the same exact question, right? So now we have what I call buy setup number one, because there are two of them on here. So lower high, lower high, lower high, higher low, lower high. See where I'm going with this? So you're looking at it, and you go, well, it did put in a higher pivot high, right? Or higher low. So, right? So you have an equal low here, and this pivot's a higher low. Good. But this top is a lower high. And not only is it a lower high, ah, Kong, you just took the words out of my mouth. Fantastic. That's my next comment. It's coming from a square top, right? It's coming from a square top. This is not an ideal buy setup. Okay. Yes, you could make an argument. It's a transitionary buy setup, lower highs, lower lows. It's right at the moving average. It's a 50% retreat. You see where I'm going? You guys, I hope you're understanding what I'm doing here. What I'm doing here is taking a new trader and giving you enough reasons to consider taking this trade. But there should be just enough not to take it also. See where I'm going? So you look at it, go, ooh, it has a higher low. That's good. Ooh, it's at the rising moving average. That's good. Ooh, it's a 50% retracement. That's good. Ooh, it's got three lower highs right here. It's got a wide range engulfing. Like you're starting to check off some boxes after a double bottom retest. Go, whew, wow. Wow, 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 wow. But you're missing some key factors here. It put in a lower high and it's a square top. There's a lot of congestion here. The risk to reward is mediocre because you're going to get in where the blue arrow is and you're going to have a stop loss down here. So you don't even have barely a one to one risk to reward. This is how you have to talk through every trade. And then you consolidate back towards the rising moving average. So then we ask, we're at the breakout now. Is this a good breakout? What do you guys think? Is this a good breakout? I'm curious to see what people think about it because there's definitely some positives and negatives here, right? There's, there's a lot of things here that, and this is why I chose this chart because in hindsight, you look at the chart and go, well, shoot, I just should have taken the double bottom. It worked. But in real time, you don't have future information in real time, right? So use that piece of paper, put it over the future. So 
you're looking somewhere around, I don't know, $13.75 would be the entry. And then where the stop loss goes, well, there's a little bit of flexibility there. You could put it under these three bars, aggressive, and you could, or you could put it under this area right here. So you're probably looking at about a dollar stop loss. And then you look at that prior pivot high, all right? And probably I should do this just to make it a little bit easier on us. So give me one second while I do it. Right? And now all of a sudden, you ask, hmm, should I take this breakout? Okay, and obviously that should be red. Okay, should I take this breakout? It's tough, isn't it? Because you do have a consolidation in a narrow range back towards the rising moving average on a stock that's put in a higher low here and a higher low here. So you're looking at it going, okay, I definitely see reasons to take it. But then I look up to the left and go, hmm, right around $15. So this is what I would tell you, full circle. This comes back to expectation. If you're in scalp mode, okay, and you're going, you know, 1375 by 1275, I get there's a pivot at 15. Um, I might move my stop loss to break even very quickly. You might be able to take this one. I think for most traders, I think it's a tough, it's a tough breakout to trade. But if you're a scalpier type trader, it might be acceptable to take this breakout. So I would say this breakout's dependent upon management. Again, tight trader, scalpy trader, probably worth it just to see if you can't get a quick pop on it. If you're not and you're patient and you want to wait for a bigger target, probably hold off or take a very small lot, third lot, quarter lot, and just maybe you'll find an area to add, which is pretty much what happens, right? So now we go to the last one, buy setup two, okay? And this stock moves up and pulls all the way back. And where does it pull back to? Price support, rising moving average, and depending on whether or not you want to consider this a full pivot, right, from the top to the bottom here or the top to the bottom here, it's a nice level of retracement, the depth of retracement. Exactly. The ceiling becomes the floor. Perfect, right? So now we're starting to see fewer and fewer notice as we've gone from double bottom retest to buy setup one to breakout to buy setup two as we move right on this chart we keep going towards the right on the chart what's happening we're getting fewer and fewer reasons not to take the trades on the left we had a lot of reasons not to take these trades and as each trade moved over each pattern whatever i can't even really give you a good reason not to take this trade Honestly, it's, it's that good. Lower highs and lower lows. Now you also have what? A higher pivot high here and a higher pivot high here. That's multiple pivot highs. You only have one higher high over here. You don't have multiple. So technically we're not in a stage two yet, but we're very close. We're in that transitionary period. So lower highs and lower lows. We pull back to price support, minor support, okay? We have rising moving average. We have a change of color bar right there. Uh, we even have a little volume spike on the entry in a stock that looks very much like it wants to transition. Wow. So we worked through that whole chart to get to a really good setup. But it took a little bit. We had to dig. We had to dig because as we moved towards it, they became a little better and a little better and a little better and a little better. Till finally there's one good enough to trade. I'm commenting spending so much time on this chart because a lot of newer traders would have taken some of these earlier patterns when in fact you should have waited for this. And you don't know this is gonna happen, but that doesn't still mean you should take the earlier trade either, okay? So we finally got to a point where we really can't think of a good reason not to take this trade. And it worked, right? First target's gonna be just above $16, and second target's gonna be the big $21 target up top here. So first target will be right around 16. You're gonna get in just around 14. Stop loss looks like a 1350. You have, what, four to one to the first target, and then gosh knows how much up here. You have a $7 move, 14 to one. That's well done. That's traded just like a professional, okay? Similar situation, but different. 
You have a stock that's clearly in a downtrend, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows. And finally, you get a little bit of a higher high, breaks above the trend line, pulls back, puts in another higher high after the gap up. And on this higher high, all right, we break above this pivot to the left with a wide range igniting bar, okay? So this is in fact a really good transitionary three bar play on a 15 minute chart. You see how extended the stock moved from $30 down to like 20, give or take. Big volume on the bottom, bounced right here and put in a higher low, breaks the trend line. So I'm not getting in here on this higher low. This is, you could argue that's the little double bottom, but it's too aggressive. You can see up here, this double bottom failed. So we don't need to be this aggressive. Breaks above the trend line, puts in a higher high. Higher high here and a higher high here, puts in two higher highs. Pulls back, puts in a higher low and a higher high. So now I have one higher high here, another higher high here. I have one higher low here and one higher low here. By definition, you are technically in a 15 minute uptrend. Yes, I know. You're in a downtrend. This little double bottom retest was your stage one. This was the transitionary period right here. And then this wide range bar followed by a narrow range bar. The breakage of this prior pivot sets off the stage two. And then we get fortunate. You get a narrow range resting bar, you get a three bar player in it like 2420, give or take, rip, and there's your target. There's your target. Pulls back, maybe goes higher. Point is this thing went, I don't know, a dollar fifty maybe, two to one, something like that. But it's walking through the chart. Okay, it's walking through the chart. All right. Now, in terms of targets, here's an example of a stock. What do you do? I get this question all the time almost daily. Hey, Jared, there's a really cool gap on ACB. It's break, It's gapping under a wide range green bar. There's nothing below it. What do I do? Well, you don't have a target. There is no target other than zero on this stock because there's no support below it. There's, there's nothing below. And that's okay. That's actually a really good thing. That's what you want to see most of the time. All right, it's what you want to see most of the time. So the stock gaps down. Yes, it's a little bit of a big gap, it's 20% or so, but it is a $7 stock, $6 stock. If this was a $100 or $200 stock, I would not touch a 20% gap down. I wouldn't touch it. But it all starts with this beautiful daily gap. Stock's in a downtrend. It tries to bounce and pop, puts in a wide range green bar on tremendous volume. And you wake up the next day and it gaps down. Shit. For the people that are long, right? So wide bar, narrow bar, you get in right there. So how do you manage this out? The only thing you can really look to is average trading range. But on a potent gap like that, it's likely to exceed average trading range. By how much? We don't know. So this is where your trading plan comes into play. If you're an all or nothing trader, simple. You don't do anything. You take the trade and you just cross your fingers. It's got enough room to go 2R assuming it's not grossly exceeded its average trading range, right? If you're a pivot trader or bar by bar trader, you just ride it as far as it'll go. That's it. If you had a pivot to the left, substantial pivot on a higher time frame, then that would be your target. Even if you were a pivot managing a trade, you would still have a target if there was a pivot to the left. But there is no target here because there's nothing below. It's a pretty simple concept. So people make more of this than they need to. This is actually the situation you're hoping for every time you take a trade, okay? Same deal here. Here's a stock that's in a downtrend on VLO. It gaps under this little consolidation here, and there's just really nothing there. Now, granted, if I went to the weekly or the monthly chart, maybe there's something to the left, I don't know. But for our purpose of this discussion, there's nothing there. So what do you get? A stock that gaps down, chops around, chops around. You get a wide range engulfing bar, takes out the bottoming tail, takes out these two green bars. Beautiful. Followed by a narrow range resting bar. Note, and this is important too, this resting bar has a slightly lower low, but that's okay. It's not terrible. It's not 50 cents. It might be 5 cents or 10 cents. That's not bad. And that's a judgment call. Because on Amazon, 50 cents might be acceptable. If you have a $10 stop loss and bar one and bar two are only 50 cents apart, that might be acceptable. But that wouldn't be acceptable on VLO. So where's the target? We don't have one. We don't have one. 
it's going lower, it chops around and continues lower. If you're doing all or nothing, it's easy. Take your all or nothing target and set it and forget it. If you're doing pivots, manage it out on pivots, right? Manage it out on pivots. And one other quick comment I wanna make. This is a really good example for those of you, wow, there's so much little stuff I'm throwing in this lecture I wasn't intending on, but it is what it is. See this pivot here? If you were managing on five minute pivots, this is a key point here. A lot of people would lower their stop to this pivot high. They would, and they would have gotten stopped out right here. The problem with doing that too soon is getting stopped out. So a lot of traders, as soon as this sell setup trade, let's say they took the three bar play, you got in on the three bar play and you're on five minute pivots, okay? And what happens is, the soon as this little sell setup triggers, right there on that red bar, they immediately lower their stop. But that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to wait for the pivot to retest the prior low, at least 80% of the prior low then lower your stop. Now, I don't know if that's 80% or not, but it's just a good learning lesson here. Don't lower your stop too soon. Let the stock wiggle around. After all, pivot management is looking for bigger targets. Give the stock the room to wiggle. And had you done that, guess what? It pays off for you. Then you can lower your stop to 41 bucks here because this put in a new low. And then you'll have to wait for it to bounce to 40.50 and do the same thing. All right, so one last slide and then we'll call it a day. This one is a little, little bit different, okay? By the way, what a great entry here at 480, huh? Look at this. Look at this uh, turnaround bar right there on ZM right there. And then you get a consolidation. So you could have bought on the turnaround bar. And this, you know how this, this would have been traded perfectly if, right? You bought on the turnaround bar and put your stop under the low, right? So you got in at like 475 and your stops are like 465, $10 stop, right? Then it chops around, guess what? Add it 480 and raise your stop to like 470, something like that. Guess what? Your cost average is now like 477, give or take. And your stop loss is up to 470 to 472. You basically cut your stop loss in half. And you didn't have to pay up very much to do it. And the reason that's important on this particular trade is because turnaround bars typically have wide stop losses. This allows you to add on a great re-entry and raise your stop up. And what happens? The stock goes ends up going like 495 or something like that. So now you can get three to one out of a trade you would have barely gotten two to one out of. See that? Normally 475 to 495, $10 stops, two to one. You added, it went almost $20. You would almost four to one on this thing. Add and reduce management is very powerful, guys. All right, anyway, that wasn't what I was intending on talking about, but it's important. So we dropped from like 525 all the way down to 460, bounced, retested. Note, bottoming tail, bottoming tail, and note, this is where this bar got engulfed. This is a very important area, 460. Stock has played around in this area, and every time it's responded with buyers. Bulls have stepped up every single time it's come to 460. So the next day you wake up, it gaps up into that 475 area. It breaks this prior pivot high on a wide range igniting bar, gives you a narrow range resting bar, and guess what? It's a relatively smooth pullback. Buy it right there. Stop loss at 480. You could use entry bar, but that's tight. Buy it right there, like, I don't know what that is, 485, 488, I don't know. And your stop loss is there at 480. It moves up, pulls back, and moves up. Was this a monster home run trade? No but it's worth taking a shot because of how it bounced at 460 and the wide range bar taking out this prior pivot. So this is a transition area, a micro time frame transition area three bar play. Okay, um, so very, very interesting. Anyway, I hope that you guys enjoyed that. I went off on a couple little tangents that I didn't intend to because I just saw them on the chart and thought, you know what, we need to talk about that on the chart. But understand in summary, when you get into a trade or before, I should say, before you get into a trade, know the expectation because it has a lot to do with if you should take the trade or not. Know where that target is. If you're a scalper, you might be able to take it. If you're not, you might not be able to. Okay, And then understand the transitions and where they're supposed to be and whether or not you're really going through your checklist properly because the goal is to look for reasons not to take it when you finally get through it and you're like i can't think of a reason not to take it then you should take it okay otherwise don't 
Trust me on this, guys, and I'm guilty. We're all guilty. The more stringent you are with your rules and criteria, the more successful you'll be with your trading. However, you'll take fewer trades, but you'll still make more money with those fewer trades because you'll be far more efficient. And I'm guilty of it too. I took a boneheaded trade yesterday in DKNG and went against a lot of stuff. So try to be as stringent as possible with your pre-trade checklist. And I understand the frustration, especially when there's a good trade and you just miss it because you're going through your checklist and after you've done the checklist, you realize, wow, that was a great trade and it went without you. I get it, it's okay. It's gonna happen again. I missed a trade this morning on PayPal. It happens. It's all right though. There's gonna be more trades out there. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that lecture. I'm Jared Wesley. We'll get back at it again next week.